Good morning. Uh, I'm Kerry Thomas from uh, Dolby Laboratories. Uh, here to talk to you about uh, Dolby Atmos music creation as part of our webinar series. Um, thanks for joining uh, today, and uh, I hope that there's some useful information uh, in this session um, and uh, that you uh, you get some benefit. Uh, we talk about you know, panning a lot in, in Dolby Atmos, and uh, you know the, the 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 basics are are fairly fairly straightforward. Um, but it uh, it became evident to me over the course of the last you know, two two or three months that there are some things that we just never talk about when it comes to music creation specifically. Um, so if you're coming from a post production background. Uh, a lot of this may be uh, very uh, very mundane, um, but uh, there's some really useful uh, things that you can achieve in in the Dolby Atmos Panner um, that uh, that might be really useful as you as you create your music. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at um, some of those uh, features and functions, um, and uh, hopefully there are a couple of uh, moments that make you go, "Ah, oh, that's how." Um, so uh, there we go. Um, so it's been a very exciting month here, and I just wanted to give you all a, a, a quick little update on some of the uh, some of the exciting things that have happened uh, in the month of October. Um, late breaking news uh, this morning was uh, Lucid Motors are going to actually ship uh, the air vehicle starting on Saturday. Um, so uh, some of, some of their customers here in California will start receiving their Dolby Atmos enabled Lucid Airs, which is very very exciting. I don't have that on the slide. Um, other exciting things that have happened. Um, so in Las Vegas, uh, uh, Dolby opened uh, Dolby Live at Park MGM. It's going to enable uh, uh, audience members and uh, you know, to, to experience their artists that are performing at that venue in Dolby Atmos. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so uh, there's a 5,200-seat uh, theater in Las Vegas um, that's been outfitted with a uh, Dolby Atmos system, and uh, so very, uh, very excited to to have that um, uh, as an opportunity to uh, have music played in in Dolby Atmos. It's an extension to the Santana um, uh, residency at House of Blues, um, but uh, yeah, very, very exciting there. We had Apple uh, Logic Pro X uh, 10.7 actually release with uh, with Dolby Atmos uh, embedded in it. Um, so this is a, it's a great great platform. Uh, if I get a chance, I will show you uh, you know how it's uh, how it all fits together very quickly here. Um, but uh, if you've not uh, not experienced it, I highly recommend downloading it from uh, from the App Store and uh, having a play with uh, with the, the Dolby Atmos integration. It's uh, maximum uh, speaker output at this time is 714, um, but uh, there's, uh, there's our Dolby Atmos binder all in there, and uh, you can work with a variety of other um, uh, configurations as well. So very excited about that development, which really enables writers, producers to start working in Dolby Atmos in a, in a platform that they, they know and love. Um, and we saw an expansion of Amazon. Um, so Amazon had been uh, on the Echo Studio with Dolby Atmos uh, and what they called 3D audio uh, for the last couple of years, um, and they uh, they've just adopted Dolby Atmos as the brand um, and spatial audio as the way to experience it um, on the uh, Amazon HD Unlimited service. So if you want to know more um, about you know, how you can experience that on iOS, Android, and of course on their Echo Studio, um, then uh, go ahead and uh, click on that link or paste that link in. Uh, Music Unlimited is what you're going to need for Dolby Atmos uh, in, in that regard. So <clears throat> let's talk about panning. Um, so Dolby Atmos is, um, you know, it, it, it's a sound field format, right? It's it's going to take the sounds that you put into your mix, um, and um, depending on where you've set these control parameters, um, uh, it's going to position that into the sound field, but then it's going to translate out into uh, the consumer environment. Um, one of the pre-submitted questions that we had was, 
why is it that Dolby insists that beds be confined to a 712 space when objects are able to use the entire 7.1.4 space and beyond? Well, the answer to the question is Atmos is not 714. Atmos is fully scalable, right? So um, we have to put constraints on um, you know, what is, uh, is possible to be achieved with certain, certain things so that we can have a consistent experience across, uh, across the, the, the entire ecosystem. So it's very easy to think of Dolby Atmos as 7.1.4. This is a home theater setup with upward firing speakers. Um, the renderer defaults to 7.1.4 for the home entertainment uh, renderer. Um, and it's quite easy to uh, misconstrue, therefore, that 7.1.4 is Dolby Atmos. That's not the case. So um, home theaters can also scale up as well as down. So it might be to a sound bar, which is a 512, 514 representation. It might be to a larger Trinov-based home theater system where you may have 32 channels um, and the sound field needs to easily fit and be consistent within that, um, uh, in, within those experiences. So Dolby Atmos is not 7.1.4. So limiting to that would mean that in a larger environments, we'd be heavily limited. So the array that you see overhead here is all fed by the dot two in the in the 7.1.2 bed so that right ch channel overhead will get everything that goes into that bed channel same with the speakers on the side so the side speaker in this uh, in this iteration can be fed from all four of these channels before then going on to the rear of the of the room that means that for music creators in particular, they lack control when it goes into those larger environments. So they find that using objects and put positioning more accurately in space gives them control over how that uh, experience is going to be given to the end user. If we look at the five speakers that are overhead in here, which of those five speakers would you choose to have be your front overheads and your rear overheads if that was 7.1.4. It doesn't make an awful lot of sense and would be very inconsistent between rooms. So that's the reason that we limit it to 7.1.2. Um, and I'm going to show you a little later on how you can actually achieve that dot four overhead, as well as share a session that you can download and play with as well um, that gives you that quad overhead capability. But it allows you to define what that is. Um, based off of where your speakers are in your room and what you want that to then translate out into the, the, the rest of the world. Because it could be that your customer, your listener, does not have those same four lo locations, but you want those four locations to maintain the coherence, the phased relationships, all of the things that um, the music engineers uh, worry uh, so correctly about, um, and we give you that flexibility. So. Flexibility and consistency is the answer to that question. So what do the panners look like? Well, you've obviously got the Dolby Atmos Music Panner, um, which is our VST audio unit and AAX plugin, um, allows for the step sequencer. We're not gonna talk about this one uh, today um, because I wanna deep dive into more of the concepts. <clears throat> Uh, we will be spending some time in Avid Pro Tools. It's the platform that I'm most comfortable with uh, these, uh, these, these, these demonstrations in. Um, and I, uh, I don't always have an up-to-date version of Nuendo and uh, Blackmagic Resolve, but the functionality is largely the same. So we're going to take a look at some of those panels quickly here uh, before we dive into the uh, hands-on uh, hands session. So you'll see that you know here we've got our divergence controls, our size controls, um, we've got uh, side percentage, and it's very similar when it comes into the uh, Steinberg Nuendo panner. This is the VST multi-panner, and you'll notice here that we've got bed mode um, as well as object mode. So the panner is the same whether you're in beds or objects, and then how you utilize that is gonna be up to uh, your creation uh, of this. 
yes, these webinars are all recording, uh, are all recorded, Ray, so uh, you can go back and uh, review this later. Um, so in this, uh, we have a great deal of control um, of what the sound field of this, uh, of this plugin and panner is going to be doing. Um, and similarly in uh, Blackmagic uh, Resolve, they have similar controls. So we have some spread controls, some size controls. So you'll see the consistent metadata and control data for the uh, for, for the uh, for the sound field for the Atmos renderer is is pretty consistent between uh, all of these platforms. So this is a very generalized breakdown as to what we you know, think about when you talk about beds and objects. So beds, those are the channel-based components, right? They're left, center, right, left side, right side, left rear, right rear, left overhead, right overhead, and the LFE. Those are predominantly, let's say, channel-based. And the way that I think about this is if you want to control that uh, sound field, then you're going to really use divergence to control how much of the outside space is feeding into anything in the middle of the room, right? So the front divergence you can claim in and it becomes more pointed. The rear divergence, same thing. Then they operate in fixed arrays. So as I discussed at the beginning with those um, arrays in the larger, uh, larger theaters and the overhead, it's going to fill the entire overhead or it's going to fill at least four speakers down the wall when you're putting something into this left side uh, channel here. With objects, it's all controlled by metadata. So wherever you place the sound in, in your Atmos space, it's going to give you the ability to define exactly how and you, you want that rendered. If you want to make something bigger, we have a size parameter. Um, we'll look at that. But it also has the ability to do these pan through arrays. So panther arrays were you know, talked about heavily in the movie theater world, right? the ability to pan very precisely up, up the, the, the wall in the, uh, in the movie theater. Um, with the latest version of the renderer, we have this, this functionality, uh, latest version uh, 3. Point, I don't know, actually version 3, um, introduced the idea of arrays in the home theater renderer as well. So now you can, you can pan something through six speakers of your overhead um, array, um, and we'll take a look at that as well. So that's for afterwards. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna share out here the, uh, the screen. Um, let's take a quick look at, uh, at Logic Pro actually before we dive too much into this. So here's my, my Logic Pro. I'm gonna create an empty project. Um, gonna set it up as surround. Um, that's how it, it, it defines. But um, in the project settings, so if I come into file, project settings, audio, um, I now have the ability to uh, change to Dolby Atmos as my spatial audio format. So if I turn this spatial audio format on, it's going to now output 7.1.2 as that bed format. Uh, my apologies. I'm going to just show my main screen. There we go. All right. Um, so now I can see, you know, spatial audio in the project settings is enabled. And I have to select that as 48K. The italicized uh, uh, channels of uh, sample rates are not available for Dolby Atmos, so it's 48K or 96K. So it sets the surround format to 7.1.2. So that's the bed format that we are used to in, in, uh, in the other workstations. On a channel-based um, uh, output then, we have the surround output. So if I right-click on this, uh, or if I double click on, on, the, um, uh, on the, the panner window here, I have the ability to pan that sound in, um, in the, the surround field. I have the ability to pull it in, at which point it's going to create a sphere in the space. And um, you know, very similar to the, uh, to the dome mode in the uh, Atmos panner, 
it's going to be um, controlling that. We have the LFE feed on this, this panel as well. What we also have is the renderer. So if I click here, I get to the renderer uh, plugin. So 7.1.4, we see that we've got the uh, binaural controls. The binaural controls can only be set if you're in the binaural monitor mode. So we set them and then when they change back to 7.1.4, they stay there, but you want to be able to hear the effect of those, those changes. You'll see there are no 3D objects. So how do I do that? So if I right click on the surround panel here, I get to select my 3D object panel. This then labels the 3D object. So SoCal Kit, which is the name of the, the track that's been assigned to that. And it changes the 3D panel. So now I can position sound uh, in, the, uh, in the space here and have that follow. I can pan it up and overhead, and again, that will that will follow out. I can reduce the spread and make it uh, very much a mono experience and control that. Um, and you see that it's all you know going to follow and pan as we as we expect. Very excited by this as a as a you know, opportunity for for content creators, and uh, it's an awful lot of fun. So uh, go ahead and uh, download that. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, let's take a look here at the the rest of Pro Tools. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen out again here in a minute, but uh, just tidying some stuff up. <clears throat> All right. So here we see my Pro Tools session. So as I um, as I said, this session um, is uh, is is going to be available for download, um, and uh, um, it it's going to provide you a bunch of the kind of concepts that we we talk about fairly regularly. Um, so let's just take a quick look at this this panel, right? So I'm going to keep the renderer uh, fairly close here so that we can we can see the effect of the movements that we're making. Won't necessarily hear them, but uh, I want you to be able to, to to experience them. So this is the traditional panner that we're used to seeing in Pro Tools, right? I can grab the ball, pan it round, and it's going to jump to the the locations as I click onto them. Uh, you know, all very arbitrary. Um, you know, nothing nothing particularly revolutionary about that. We also have, if you right-click, the theater mode that we're used to seeing, and that demonstrates the height capabilities. So you've, you'll have seen a lot of this in other videos and other methods um, of, uh, of learning. Um, with, actually, is that out of the way? There we go. All right. So with the with the renderer, we have the ability to set up our room. So we've got our 916 room set up here. These uh, these dark boxes or, or light boxes around the speakers represent those arrays. So I'm showing something a little fake here. Um, you know, obviously this is a, my laptop. I'm not really gonna use this, but I want to show you some of the concepts that exist. So in talking about that shaker, if I put that up and overhead, you see that that fills the entire overhead array. That's probably not what we want in a lot of circumstances. We go to the left, we go to the right. Great. It's pretty limiting. If I set that to be an object now, I can pan through this overhead array. So I can, as I pull back, I can attention each one of those speakers. So one of the reasons to use an object might be that you want to have that granular control. I also have the ability to pan through a wide speaker. So if I go to a wide speaker, you can see that that is lighting up there. If I flick, flick this back to the bed, the sound will represent, but it will represent as a phantom left, 
uh, phantom image between this left and the left side. So you can address the entire space as an ob as a as a bed, but the power of the of the, the, the object becomes evident when you start working in uh, in in these larger spaces and you know, being more precise about those placements. If you want to get even more kind of precise about how the sound field is constructed, let's take a look at some of these other parameters. So the overhead, uh, you know, the, the the elevation modes you're probably familiar with, right? So we can pan up and back, and it gives you a um, a, a decent uh, representation of where that uh, where that sound is going to be. So. You don't see it, but you kind of hear the effect that's that's going on in there. And so the session will be available for download. If I switch that to an object mode, now you see it. You see it pan up to the center and then down to the back of the room. You keep it up as dome mode. It's going to do that dome uh, uh, over the top and back. But what happens if you want to control this a little differently? Well, I can position something a little back in the room, I can increase the size parameter of it, and I can fill that space. So 30 on the size parameter, that's going to fill 30% of the uh, of the available mix space. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I don't want it to go overhead. So we actually have the ability here to disable height. So I can take my three-dimensional size and make it two-dimensional. I can make it all exist only on the horizontal plane. And you see those overheads are not being activated. This might be useful if you want to bring a vocal off the front uh, front wall, um, make it fill more of the space, um, a, you know, a little uh, wider, but make it more present. Put stuff behind it so that you're not, uh, you're not um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in an isolated uh, vocal state. We also have things like speaker snap. So speaker snap um, allows you to very precisely position sound only in a particular speaker. It's being overridden here by the size parameter. So if I wanted to just get to that speaker, or just get to that speaker, or just get to the wide, I can do that with speaker snap. It allows you to sculpt and control exactly which of your arrays of speakers might be, might be used. Same with the overhead. If I go up in the overheads, now I'm going to go to that speaker, and then exclusively to that speaker, and then exclusively to that speaker. Allows you to very you know, accurately sculpt the sound field. Let's turn that height off again. One of the next features that we have is the zone exclusions. So zone exclusions can be really useful. So if I put that, you know, sound back up to 30%. It's feeding all of the horizontal plane, right? It's feeding a little less into the surround, more into the sides, more into the wides, but it's filling the entire space. So in non-Atmos bed, so non-Atmos object, I have a control called size percentage. Size percentage, side percentage, I can reduce down, and it should reduce those. Clearly not doing it for some reason. I don't quite know why. Um, but with the Atmos uh, object, we have this ability to right-click on here and say that actually, I don't want the sound ever to go into those side speakers. I only want it represented off the LCR and the sur surround. I don't want it to go to the left and right. I only want it to be in the center and the surround. These things can be really useful, particularly when we start talking about the virtualized spaces um, that are represented in the Atmos field. Right? So when you're thinking about spatial audio on Apple Music, that might give you the ability to more accurately define, but also support um, a vocal while keeping it, uh, keeping it in front of other supporting elements. Um, it might give you the ability to actually fill the space in a in a, in a, in a more cohesive fashion. Uh, comb filtering is reduced because we decorrelate all of the signals. 
um, and uh, you know, so it, it can be very very useful to uh, uh, to make use of these these functions. <clears throat> so, very uh, you know, kind of brief overview of what the Pana functionalities that exist are and the opportunities that exist. Not saying one is particularly you know great or not, but just giving you these uh, giving you these insights into how you can actually utilize the Pana in a more um, uh, you know, deeply, uh, deeply utilized fashion. So, <clears throat> a couple of other things that have come up. Let's say that you know I want to have um, two sounds treated the same way. So here I've got a slap bass and a shaker. I have the ability to use a single panner and pan that shaker and the slap bass around together. I don't have to bus anything into an auxiliary and then you know, keep, keep track of where that panner is actually following from. The, the integration actually allows us to do that. So here I've got my master object control mode. You can only have one object, uh, one channel in master control for uh, a, a particular um, uh, input to the renderer. So if I disable this one, then I have the ability to enable this. And again, that shaker will follow this panner, even though that is panning on that slap base. So very quick and easy to actually make those, make those assignments um, and have instrumentation follow each other around uh, on a single panner. Um, and uh, you don't have to waste an awful lot of time with all of those auxiliaries and things. Um, all of the parameters are going to follow. So if you want to increase the size parameter on that, it's going to follow in, in that regard as well. So I showed you some of those pan through arrays and, uh, and other functions. Um, what happens, you know, we, well, we, we hear and we'll see again from, from, from Steve here in a, in, in a minute where he talks about things like his object beds and his static locations. How does he actually achieve those? Well, in Pro Tools, uh, I've set up here a, um, uh, a track preset. So I'm going to recall sends uh, for my fixed object panning strategy. And what this gives me then is four objects. I, I've done four, you can do many, many more, but I've used four. So if I want to very quickly get to these wide speakers, I'm just going to go ahead and activate those, um, those channels. So this allows me to get to those wide speakers um, using this, using this panel. And that's done with um, this panel. So this panel is actually controlling that experience. So I've actually moved them slightly. So there's my wide speaker. There's my wide locations. So if I disable that, it goes back to very much mono at the front. Then I have wide speaker uh, control. If I wanted to do the front half of the overhead speakers, I can do that. So that's being controlled by these, these panners. So I've got the height at 100. I've put size at 10, so it's just going to fill 10% of the overhead space um, and uh, positioned between where these two speakers would be. So the, uh, the, the, the left front, the left middle uh, um, speaker is represented around about here. Again, this is in, in my room, my phantom room. Uh, if I wanted to have that go to the, the rears. I can do that as well. And very quickly build up this sound field that is going to give my, uh, my music the dynamic, dy dynamic mixing that you might want. All of this is obviously controlled by the sends. Um, so mix and match the levels and uh, you, can, uh, you can structure that. Um, and we talked about the, uh, the the overhead um, capabilities. 
So that dot four overhead, if I wanted to, I can do that very easily here. So if I didn't want to have, um, sorry, close folder. <clears throat> so here, my bed channels um, are going left, right, um, front, back, etc. But I've disabled height on it. I've disabled height on it because I actually want this not to use those channels nine and ten. I want to use them with my overhead quad. So what I'm going to do is actually use my quad overhead output. So my quad overhead output. There we go. So here's my quad overhead output. So I'm going to increase the level on this. And that is going to feed then into this guy. And what this is doing is actually outputting from the renderer. So if I go to IO, outputting from the renderer on quad OH. So these first four channels of the, of the, of the busing, of the object busing, are then set up as a quad output. And then using sub paths or sub output paths to have OH1 and OH2. That OH1 and OH2 are further defined as mapping to the renderer on inputs 11 through 14. And again, this session is available for download, so I'm going to not go too deep into it. I'm going to allow you to play, play on that. But anything that feeds out of a quad overhead bed is then going to be controlled by the panning metadata on these two channels. These two channels are sending the static metadata, and the audio output to the renderer is being sent directly of an output. So this allows us to then position in the overhead quad array where I'd want those sounds to actually fill. So I can pan overhead uh, in that sense. I can also follow main pan. So if I stop that and follow main pan, it's not going to give me the ability to, to follow that. Right? But as I pan this sound, it's going to position that into the rear of the space and the overhead. So you can construct your sound field very quickly, very easily, and that will translate into movie theaters, into homes, into the brand new Lucid Air if you uh, wanted to, to buy one of those. Um, and also into all of the headphones and, uh, and, and capabilities that are existing in the marketplace. So you'll see there's an awful lot more under the cover of what, uh, what Dolby Atmos can do. Um, and using the built-in panning capabilities of your workstation um, and the integration with the object panners in, uh, in, 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 in those uh, platforms as well, um, then you can uh, you can actually do an awful lot and uh, really build out your sound field. So I hope that's been useful. Um, I'm going to uh, jump back to my slides here for a minute. And uh, there's my presentation and slideshow. There we go. Um, so if you want to know more about some of these panning strategies I mentioned, uh, Steve Jenowick goes into it in his Mix with the Masters session uh, that's available. Um, he talks about those wide locations, how he actually um, sets those uh, sets those up and what he's learned about using those. Um, so definitely worthwhile uh, diving in there. Um, also have the music creation series. Uh, so if you go to professional.dolby.com slash music creation 101, um, there's six episodes. Um, Luke presents um, setting up your home studio and getting working with the renderer. And then the fantastic Maggie Tobin takes you through headphone work um, and uh, uh, very, very worthwhile uh, listening to and watching through all of those, uh, those materials. Um, and as always, there's a bunch of learning resources. So learning.dolby.com uh, has a full curriculum. Uh, it actually takes you through a bunch of these concepts as well, um, but uh, um, yeah, very uh, very useful. And the workflow guidelines. So you've all seen these before, but there they are. 
So um, I'm going to jump into uh, jump into questions here. Uh, I see there are a bunch, um, and uh, hopefully that's uh, that's really useful. Um, are the object panners mono in only of the stereo versions? Um, so the renderer, um, uh, the, the 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 renderer um, actually allows you to uh, the renderer will only define uh, mono inputs, right? So the renderer doesn't care whether it's mono, stereo, um, five one, five zero. Um, it treats the audio coming in and the metadata controlling that input channel uh, to the renderer. Um, as individual elements. So um, what it does is, you know, allow then the manufacturers of the workstations to define how those um, are going to be uh, going to be you know, in implemented, right? So uh, Nuendo has a 5.0 panner for objects. Um, so inside of the VST multi panner, what they've enabled is um, those five objects to be controlled using all of the uh, all of the other sessions uh, parameters, all of the plugin parameters, the Steinberg uh, pan law that's implemented, and use that to control the audio output that is then being defined. So, if you have a stereo track and you want a stereo panner, Nuendo, Pro Tools, all of the workstations will allow you to actually control those, um, but um, it, the renderer treats everything that comes in as as a mono signal. Um, so it's it's really about how you uh, how you build that out. Um, if a project is mastered for home theater and studio, do you have to remaster the file if you have to deliver for cinema, or can the home theater master be suited for theater pr uh, provided within your spec? Um, so. Uh, if, if you're creating a theatrical uh, release, it has to be done in a theatrical Atmos room. Um, so uh, what it um, uh, what that means is you know, all of your panning metadata, all of your panning control will translate. So you can take your existing workstation session, take that to a mixing stage, um, and their room has been defined uh, in their renderer. So very similar to you know how you set it up at home. Um, if we go into um, into a larger room, um, then that will uh, that will actually uh, translate to their speaker locations. Um, so what it, what you will find though is there's much higher dynamic range, much higher capabilities in those speakers. Um, so you may want to make changes to to your mix uh, based off of what you then hear in that movie theater. So that's why we recommend um, uh, it, um, the um, uh, you know creating those masters in that file. The DCP, the digital cinema package that's then created from the the MXF, um, uh, is uh, is is then able to be played in any movie theater that's Dolby Atmos enabled. Um, so, you know, there are six and a half thousand um, movie theaters around the world or something crazy number like that, um, that would enable you to take that, uh, that file and play it in a, uh, in a, in a Dolby Atmos movie theater. So a uh, good way to uh, have launch parties and things like that. So. <clears throat> Some stage, can you please talk about how music will sound when played through an old fashioned high quality stereo system? Uh, sure, um, it, it it should sound great. <laughs> uh, Atmos won't necessarily play back, um, uh, but that's the that that's that's where we kind of draw the line, right? Is you know, the the playback experience? Um, it should be an immersive experience. Um, you could theoretically take the binaural and play it over a stereo system. Um, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but it's certainly an option. Um, but uh, you know the the way that the home decoders operate is that you know if you've got Atmos uh, files coming in, but your system is not capable of playing them back, your receiver will have already been set up to do 2.0, um, and uh, so it should kind of fall back through the system appropriately. Um, you know, there there are a number of people that are starting to work kind of in Atmos first and thinking about what the 
derivation of the uh, of the stereo might be from Atmos. Um, I think that it's it's probably not you know quite where it needs to be, but um, I think that there's um, there's there's a lot of exploration being done there because of the economics, right? It's it's very similar to the way the movie uh, industry and the television industry have, have adopted. You know, if you work in the the mezzanine format, the largest format first, it will fold down through those other um, other formats. So. Hopefully that's uh, that's useful uh, as an answer to your question. Um, does ADM B-Wave support the binaural metadata from the Dolby binaural plugin? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that ADM B-Wave is the package file that is going to then go from your workstation. Uh, if you send it to a mastering engineer, it will have um, the, 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 the metadata embedded in that so that they can use that and, and make sure that they um, uh, you know, the, the, their expected behavior is, is occurring, um, and uh, then also out into the encoders. So as we talked about last month, that in the translation uh, webinar, um, you know, the, the metadata that's embedded in that um, gets encoded to AC4 IMS for playback now on Amazon Music, on iOS and, uh, and Android, as well as Tidal on uh, iOS and Android, Ungama, Ungami, um, very, uh, very, very widely used. What it won't do is get into the speaker base playback, the DD plus jock uh, codec um, that uh, that is being used on on some platforms, including Apple Music as well. Uh, what external controllers from manufacturers can be used with Dolby Atmos Pro Tools? Um, so there's the uh, perennial uh, JL Cooper Panner, which if it still operates, um, is 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 absolutely fantastic. Um, the uh, uh, Avid control uh, for iPad is uh, is gaining an awful, awful lot of traction, particularly from engineers who maybe started working in a um, in a in a an S six based studio, but are now set up at home. They're finding that they can do just as much um, with the um, uh, the panning capabilities on the uh, on the iPad as they could potentially with the MTM on the S four and S six. So uh, very uh, very useful. Um, there. Um, so, uh, how can we access the uh, the Pro Tools session? Um, so, I'm going to send here the message to the entire audience. So, in the chat, you'll find uh, a link to the Pro Tools session download. Um, uh, if for some reason the download link doesn't work, it's because I forgot to set the preferences. Save the link, and I will fix that. Um, but uh, um, uh, hopefully that will get you to a place where you can actually get to those overhead uh, overhead speakers and uh, those those fixed locations. Get panning in 7.1.4, 7.1.6 if you wished, um, and um, you know very uh, very much uh, you know build it to your specification. So how it actually you know is going to work in in your room and in your session and your preferences that is. Um, uh, uh, is, is very much defined by you. Um, is the great altiverb in Atmos? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, altiverb um, is, is, uh, has a 7.1.2 implementation um, of their plugin. Um, I'm not clear if they've got a 7.1.4, which would they would they would then pair up and route out much in the same way that uh, exponential audio does with uh, with R2 and Phoenix um, for their 3D or surround panners. Um, but uh, it's certainly possible. I'm pretty sure that inside from uh, from Audio East does. So um, that's uh, that's something that uh, you should investigate. Um, as I keep you know say for for for, for months at this point. The, the the plugin manufacturers are adopting and uh, deciding that actually getting into into Atmos um, uh, creation is is something they want to do, and so um, you know that's uh, that that's meaning that they're now taking their existing plugins, implementing them in ways that can be used uh, in, um, uh, in 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 Dolby Atmos music creation, and so we're going to continue to see that evolution. We're going to continue to see. Um, you know, manufacturers adopting and developing their tools into what their customers are already asking for. Um, 
uh, Jeff, Jeff Kleiser call, calls out here that uh, hats off to Sound Particles for their Space Controller plugin. Absolutely, um, you know, the, the, the team at Sound Particles um, has been developing some fantastic plugins for many years. The Energy Panner, the Space Controller, like it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cool what they're able to do. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of ahead of the, uh, ahead of the curve there. Um, no, it's not mandatory for all speakers to be the same in the studio for Atmos. What we do uh, recommend, you know, following the best practices, um, is to be able to have um, uh, ideally the same output levels and frequency responses, and that can be uh, managed using some base management um, to to support the uh, the system and uh, um, you know very uh, very 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 much. Um, uh, you know, get get Dolby involved, and we'll 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 help you get to where you need to be. <clears throat> uh, does Atmos built into Logic allow you to monitor Apple's spatial audio algorithm in real time? Uh, no. Um, so they're using the Atmos binaural um, uh, in the same way that it's coming out of the renderer, um, and uh, you know that's it's very much up to Apple to uh, to to to. To decide how they're going to achieve uh, what your what your desire is. Um, since now Logic has Atmos functionality built in, will it be the same for Pro Tools in future releases? Um, I don't know of uh, Avid's plans for that. Um, uh, you know, it's it's very much in in their uh, product roadmap to, uh, to to decide if and when that might be a uh, a desirable feature, um, but. Uh, um, yeah, not uh, not 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 in uh, not in my knowledge. Uh, do Tidal and Amazon use the Atmos binaural re-render? Um, uh, I'm not going to ask the second part of your question, right? Um, so no, they use the the um, they use the binaural metadata, but they're not using the re-render. Um, they're using our AC4 IMS codec that is then decoding in the applications. Uh, or on the devices. Um, so depending on how uh, how that's actually delivered, um, uh, it's it's going to uh, either decode on the device uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, title on Android, um, or it's going to uh, decode um, in in the application as it is on Amazon uh, on iOS. So. But the binaural metadata and the binaural experience should be very, uh, very close to uh, being exactly what comes out of the renderer. So, <clears throat> are there templates for Logic available as well? Uh, yes. Um, so there's there's some built into Logic. I know more in development. Um, uh, there's also, um, I believe, on our website on professional.dolby.com or professionalsupport.dolby.com. Um, uh, some uh, some some other templates, and uh, uh, certainly if you go into our professional support portal, um, you will find an awful lot of new articles about how to do certain things and what to expect and what not to expect in um, uh, in in, uh, in in the logic panners and uh, the capabilities there. Is it wise to set a one-second pre-roll when bouncing ADM and creating a master file? Um, to a certain extent, yes. Um, so the delivery requirements uh, are that they match the um, uh, match the stereo release, right? So we're, we're we're timing them out to the stereo release. So if you're printing into the renderer, I definitely recommend printing with a um, with a with a, a, a a portion of silence at the beginning of it, because it's going to decode LTC and needs to uh, need to jump into um, uh, into the uh, in in, in well, punch into the renderer, right? Like you stripe the tape, it needs to decode the LTC to actually punch in. Um, the ADM export can then be set to be exactly from the um, uh, from the start of the the music uh, file, uh, or you can export the ADM, pull it back into a mastering uh, engineer's system uh, who will trim up and, uh, and time that out to the, uh, to the release as well. So um, 
for actual encode, no, don't include that. For uh, creation in the renderer, maybe yes. Um, is the new Logic Panner able to pan music for satisfactory commercial use just by mixing surround on headphones? Uh, theoretically, yes. Um, I, I I would be really truly hesitant of doing that um, and releasing straight out um, because of all of the complexities that go on with um, with the other playback uh, mechanisms. So, um, you know, for example, as we covered last month. Apple Music is using DD Plus Jock to virtualize 7.1.4 in a in, in, their, in their in their space, while what happens in the renderer uh, might give you a decent representation of that. Um, we cannot guarantee it, so I'd highly recommend listening in a music studio um, with uh, with the speakers uh, all set up. So um, yeah. Your, your mileage will absolutely vary with it, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. We're only creating music for delivery to music streaming, not theatrical. Should we stick to ProLogic? Um, uh, no. Um, so uh, I, my, my personal preference for this is actually to um, ignore the ProLogic um, side of it, uh, to use the, um, uh, the 5.1 direct render um, excuse me, something just flew into my eye. Um, and um, uh, that gives you essentially what the fold down into, into 5.1 would be, um, and then balanced out accordingly there. Um, so uh, uh, no, I, I would say that uh, the 5.1 direct render is probably the, the way forward um, for those, uh, those parameters. Uh, do you need the the Dolby renderer in Logic? Is it integrated? It's fully integrated. Um, so they've uh, they've integrated all of the rendering capabilities um, into into Logic. Um, so uh, um, it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty cool what they've been able to do. <laughs> uh, can you walk through the music mastering process for Dolby Atmos? Uh, can the 20 track ADM uh, be manipulated with basic limiting to achieve precise desired loudness? Um, yeah, so there's a number of mastering engineers who are now working in Dolby Atmos, and frankly, their process varies as much as it does in stereo. Um, so the the album construction guidelines that uh, that are on the uh, on the slide deck here. Um, Kind of outline, uh, you know, pulling in those ADMs and being able to actually um, uh, time them out. And uh, uh, there is a number of different uh, pathways to achieving what you're trying to achieve. Um, so some of, some mastering engineers are uh, using uh, uh, the same limiter compressor across all channels, side chaining from a common input. Um, and, uh, and and kind of trying to achieve what you're what you're seeking there, um, but it is very much um, you know uh, the mastering engineer is going to work in very different ways depending on what they're trying to achieve. Um, Nuendo, should it be possible to have a 7.1.4 effects track with 7.1.4 reverb plugin as an object track in order to get to all channels to the screen speakers in a 7.1.4 uh, room? Um, very similar. Um, I forget exactly the, um, the, 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 the path that needs to be achieved for that .4 overhead. Um, uh, but um, if you... If you use the 7.1.4 path in, in Nuendo, um, uh, those first two channels um, are not going to feed, they're going to feed the entire overhead array um, uh, instead of feeding just the front speakers. So you actually need to break them out of that. So it needs to be very similar to what I showed in, in, in the Pro Tools. It's going to be 14 channels that you're actually using. Uh, and you're not using those channels nine and ten um, of, of the, the, the bed, um, and then you've got the, the statically assigned objects. So um, yeah, it, it's it, it's not exactly as straightforward as, um, as 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 I think we'd all like for that to be achievable. Um, 
is there a way to preview music tracks for clients on headphones? Yes, um, a, a, a good number of ways. Um, so uh, there's the binaural re-render. So if you go into the re-render uh, functionality um, and create a re-render of type bin, um, that's going to give you the experience of what listening to app, uh, app music on um, Amazon or Tidal uh, on headphones is going to be. Uh, that's using our AC4 IMS, but this is actually going to output a um, a, a PCM-based wave. So that's that's option one. To get what you're going to experience on Apple Music, there's a procedure where actually you um, can take the MP4 export um, and uh, then send that to um, uh, send that to the uh, uh, an iOS device. Um, play it on files application, which is a free download from Apple's uh, iTunes store or App Store. Um, I'm old. Um, and um, uh, then actually with the AirPod Pros or AirPod Maxes, then you can get the experience of what spatial audio is with head tracking and everything else that goes on there. Um, is Amazon Atmos for studio speaker only, or do they do full Atmos and binaural as well? Um, so the speaker-based playback um, for the, from the Echo Studio is, uh, is, is, is limited to the Echo Studio. Um, uh, the binaural um, experience on, um, uh, on iOS and, and Tidal is using our binaural metadata um, to be able to, um, to, 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 to actually get as close to that renderer as possible. Um, is Dolby Atmos Cinema Mastering only exportable out of the external renderer? Yes. Um, so Dolby Cinema Masters have to be created in a Dolby Cinema room, um, which uh, is uh, using a different uh, software base of uh, of the code uh, and um, you know much much higher channel outputs. Um, so in 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 that sense. Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty much uh, limited to those. Um, so yeah. Um, just checking through some of the questions. Lots of notes in here as well, which is great. Um, where can I get more music sessions mixed in Atmos? Um, good question. Uh, I mean, obviously, the the there's a lot of sensitivity around. Them being you know, quite as wide in the uh, in the in the um, uh, in the you know they're essentially stems in, in many cases, so there's a lot of sensitivity around protection of the assets and things like that. So um, certainly not something that we're going to be pushing out. Um, but uh, honestly, my answer has to be find some colleagues and uh, and, and 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 work with them. On understanding what they're doing and uh, you know where, where that can be um, uh, you know be more successful. So yeah, collaboration um, across across the industry is is really the the answer to that. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, Anish. <laughs> um, is there a standalone tool for ADM B wave loudness analysis? Uh, so the renderer will actually do um, the, the the loudness analysis. So if you load an ADM B wave in, it will um, it will actually do that loudness analysis. Um, in terms of uh, you know making adjustments to that, um, no, it's very much on a uh, on a workstation by workstation basis. So you can import an ADM into Logic, into um, Nuendo, into Blackmagic, into Pro Tools. Uh, and make those adjustments, um, but there's an offline measurement in the in the renderer. So if you just want to quickly check where where something is, you can open up that uh, renderer, open the master file, ADM, go to the window menu, and you'll find a loudness analysis uh, button. That's an offline loudness analysis that uh, that you can run. Um, so yeah, well that's all the time we have um, uh, for right now. Um, but uh, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the uh, time to, uh, to 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 spend with me. I hope it was useful, um, and uh, yeah, um, look forward to hearing what you guys create. All right, have a great day.